Hello, everyone. We are broadcasting to you live from the Lantern Floating Ceremony. We are up on the Motoyasu Bridge uh, overlooking the event. So you may be wondering what you're looking at, and I can zoom in a little bit and show you a little more of what's going on. Um, but essentially, um, we have people gathering here, and they're preparing to float lanterns in the river. Um, now, this is an event that takes place every single year. Um, and it's a really important part of Hiroshima's um, peace memorial ceremony. So you may be wondering, you know, why do people float lanterns in the river? And one thing I'd like to tell you about is that um, this year there's only going to be ten. Uh, there's only going to be ten lanterns that they're floating here um, because um, of of Corona. It's it's going to be um, you know fairly fairly limited, right? So uh, they don't want to have as many. Normally there are ten thousand lanterns that light up the river here um, in front of the A-bomb dome, which is just up over this way. So, and I apologize for my uh, not exquisite camera work, but I'm going to try to do better as I, as I go along. So, um, let me tell you a little bit about, um, you know, kind of how this tradition started, right? So, uh, if you watched a little bit of our last segment, you would have seen how, um, or you would have heard me talk about how people jumped into the rivers to escape the fires on August 6th. And um, the, the rivers in Hiroshima, the tides do change uh, the height of the rivers. The tides were in, so many people jumped into the rivers. Um, but of course, due to the nature of the atomic bombing, um, many people were burned beyond recognition, um, or they jumped into the rivers and they couldn't continue swimming due to radiation poisoning, due to, um, due to their injuries and things like that, right? So as a result of that, um, we wound up with, um, with many people uh, who just disappeared, essentially, on those, on those days. Their, his their histories became a blank on, uh, on August 6th. 1945. So here we are 75 years later, and um, I'll tell you a little bit about how this tradition started. So in Hiroshima Prefecture, there's actually um, there's a special tradition that people do during Obon. So um, what is Obon, right? Obon is the, um, Obon is the uh, uh, national holiday in which people go and they visit their family graves and um, they, you know, they clean the graves, they'll put incense and things like that. But in Hiroshima Prefecture, there's a special uh, thing that they do where they, um, they take a, a lantern and they place a paper lantern at the family grave, right? So um, they usually use colorful lanterns, but on the first, the first obon after someone has died, they'll place a white lantern instead. So, on August 6th, 1946, exactly one year after the bombing, people gathered here at this very spot, and they came down into the wa down to the water's edge, and they placed paper lanterns, white paper lanterns, each one inscribed with the name of someone who disappeared into the fires or or vanished into the into the waters uh, of Hiroshima on August 6th, the year before. So, um, and after that, it became a tradition, right? So um, people continued to come each year and place lanterns afloat in the, um, in the river. And in true Hiroshima tradition, they became uh, colorful lanterns. And now today, um, usually what happens is many people gather and uh, people can write their own messages. So, so um, people from all around the world will write, uh, you know, peace messages and things like that. On, uh, on their lanterns and set them afloat in the river. And as I mentioned, 10,000 lanterns uh, light up the river and it's so beautiful. And, um, and I'm sorry that it won't look quite that amazing this year, but the fact that they're still doing it, um, even with the corona situation, shows you how important this tradition is here in Hiroshima. And down here you'll see there's even like some people in the water. So they'll have people in the water to help guide um, the lanterns out um, so that they don't, they don't, you know, come back to the edge. So they actually get into the flow of the river. And they have like boats and stuff that, um, you know, down at either end that make sure that things don't, you know, go floating out to sea or like, you know, just disappear. Um, so there's some other interesting traditions that also um, came up around the same time. So the following year, 1947, right? 
Um, that was the first official peace memorial ceremony that took place here in Hiroshima. And at it, um, there, was, uh, there was a really amazing moment when um, the first elected mayor of Hiroshima, Shinzo Hamai, who's an amazing advocate for peace. He was an, he was an A-bomb survivor. He's often referred to as the A-bomb mayor. Um, and he was reelected over and over and over for a really long time. Um, he gave the first declaration of peace from Hiroshima. So he stood here in the Peace Park and um, he read a declaration of peace from Hiroshima and in it he said that when we're faced with a crisis you know like this and I think we all know that we're faced with a lot of different crises right now right um, that when we're faced with a crisis we have to have a revolution of thought right and um, we have to change the entire way that we're thinking and in order to adapt to the situation. And at that point, people in Hiroshima, they started rebuilding the city, and everyone, um, they had this in mind that it would be a city of peace, right? So that idea that Hiroshima would be a city of peace uh, came immediately. It was just part of the landscape of Hiroshima um, after the bombing. And as, um, as they had that peace ceremony, in it, hamai son said in the Declaration of Peace, he also said that he said that Hiroshima must be, it must arise as the forerunner of a new world and a new civilization. And that's another one of the really amazing things about Hiroshima is that it's something that, um, you know, having it be a city of peace, it was never about like this, like this navel gazing, like we're just going to, you know, we're a city of peace and, you know, forget about the rest of the world. Like they can do whatever they want. That was never the way it was in Hiroshima. Instead, it was like, no, no, we need to build peace that can be for the whole world, right? It starts here, but we're going to spread that message and that idea um, through the world. And um, there's so much outreach that happens in Hiroshima as a result of that to, to try to share those ideas. So, um, so uh, that's been very much part of, part of Hiroshima. Um, so then what happened after that, right? So um, they established the Peace Park, and, um, and there were actually people that started living like in this area in the Peace Park at that time, which is well, this kind of green area you see on your left. And um, they kind of set up shacks and stuff because everybody lost their houses, right? Everything was destroyed. So they were, um, there were some people living there, and they actually kind of had to be like, you know, sort of removed um, from that area. And the city did, you know, build housing for them, but a lot of people were like, no, you know, this is where we live now, and they didn't really want to go, so there was a lot of contention over that. Um, in fact, when um, Mayor Shinzo Hamai, the Avon mayor, gave his, uh, that first peace declaration from Hiroshima, um, he was, uh, as he was standing there, there were like shanties and stuff behind him. You can see in some of the photos, like a lot of them are like framed looking up at him so that it looks really epic, but there's some other ones that you can see that are looking kind of more straight at him, and there's totally just like shacks and stuff behind him. Um, so if, if you're wondering, for those of you who don't speak Japanese, who's shouting in the background, um, that's, uh, there are uh, people here to help try to keep people from gathering too closely. Um, but of course, you know, people all want to see what's happening in the river. And actually now they're, they're placing the lanterns in the river, so I'm going to zoom in on this for you guys. And I do apologize for my less than ideal camera work. So there you have it. They're placing the first lanterns in, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and that's the tenth one. But I see more coming. So you know they said there were only going to be ten, but I'm definitely seeing more than ten. So um, maybe they decided to do it differently. I don't. I don't know. Um, hopefully we'll get to see more. Um, and you can't quite see the glow yet because. Um, because it's still kind of bright out. As it gets darker, um, you'll see, well, you can see a little bit, that yellow one, that yellow one, you can see it flickering, right? So, um, and these are gonna be inscribed with peace messages. We can see people um, who are gathering there. Of course, people are taking photos and things like that. Nice.
Very nice. Yeah, it looks like we're going to maybe have more than than just 10. You know, I was hoping that they would have, like, at least 75, right? You know, like a birthday cake or something, but, you know. Um, but I'm not sure exactly how many we're going to see yet, but it definitely looks like we have more than 10, and it seems like there may be some more coming. Uh, maybe. So we'll see what happens. Um, in any case, right, so... What happened after that? So a lot of you may know about the Peace Memorial Museum, which is another really important part of Hiroshima. So how did the museum get started? Um, it actually has a, its own amazing history, and it's such an important part of the landscape here in, you know, the, 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 the cultural landscape here in Hiroshima. So I'll tell you a little bit about it as they get more of these lanterns loaded out into the river. So um, believe it or not, the museum started because of a man named Nago Kashoko, who was a geologist. And um, after the bombing, literally the day after the bombing, uh, he came into the ruins of Hiroshima to try to find out, you know, what had happened to the city. And, uh, you know, he wanted to know, because he was working at the university, at Hiroshima University. Uh-oh, I think we have, one, we have one burning. We have one burning. Oh, no. We have a casualty. And it looks like the yellow one maybe didn't quite make it. But, you know, this happens every year as well. I'm not sure what the percentage is of, of lantern casualties, but, um, you know, we'll be reporting to you so you can you can see all the action. Um, so Shogo-san, the geologist, he came in and he, he wanted to know, like, you know, were his colleagues safe, were his students safe, were his samples safe? And when he came into the city the day after the bombing, he, um, he was very tired. It was a hot August day. And, of course, keeping in mind, like, what was the city like at that moment? So it wasn't like you see it here today. Um, you know, it wasn't this, like, built-up city. I'll, sp I'll pan up so you can get a sense, right? So it wasn't this, like, you know, it didn't have buildings and things like that. It was, it was nothing like this. Um, it was a rubble-strewn wasteland. There were ashes and um, rubble. Uh, you know, the only buildings that did survive looked like this guy right here, the A-bomb dome. And um, people... Uh, and of course there were corpses like all over and there were makeshift uh, crematoria fires all over as well. So um, so what happened is, uh, you know, he was wandering through and, you know, so keeping in mind, like, so it's this hot August day, like, plus there's all that stuff going on. So, you know, he's going to have a few things on his mind. And um, he sits down to rest at, at the ruins of a shrine called Gokoku Jinja. And that shrine is actually still here in Hiroshima today. And he sat down to rest on a stone lantern, and as he did, as soon as he sat on it, he immediately jumped up again in pain. He felt like he'd sat on a pincushion, and he whirled around and looked, and what he saw was um, something that just totally blew his mind. There were all these needle-like formations sticking out of the stone. Now, most people, myself included, I would have looked at that, and, you know, like I said, you know, this is in the middle of rubble and ashes and corpses and cremation fires, and I would have just been like, this is not you know, the most horrific thing I've seen today and I'm going to move on. But he, being a geologist, he looked at that and he said, oh, that's a quartz transformation. That happens at such and such, you know, degrees Celsius. Um, and he recognized it as, as being, as being this, this geological phenomenon, right? So his, his, his scientific brain just kicked in and was like, oh yeah, like, that's what this is. And the other thing that's amazing about that is that he also knew that firebombs don't get hot enough to do that. And remember that nobody knew what had hit Hiroshima at this point. This is the day afterward. People didn't know about the atomic bomb. The atomic bomb was developed in complete secrecy. And around, at that time, already around 100, 120 Japanese cities had been destroyed by firebombing. So he just figured that, you know, firebombing of some kind. But when he saw that, he said, no, this was something else. This was something different, right? And in Hiroshima, there are many, uh, many objects that are made out of granite because there's a granite quarry nearby. In fact, if I pan over to this uh, boardwalk right here, you'll see that all that stonework, yep, that's all granite. Um, so there's still lots of granite in the city today. And so he was able to observe this phenomenon all over the city. And he started, what he did is he started recording the locations of these stones because, because that quartz transformation was only visible on one side of each stone. And the side, 
that was transformed was the side facing the hypocenter, facing the center of the explosion. And so he decided that he would find out exactly where the middle of it was by mapping the locations of the stones. And that's what he did. And after he located, he pinpointed the, the, what's called the hypocenter, so that's the point at ground level, directly under the explosion. Um, from there, he, um, he started measuring the angle of atomic shadows that had been burnt into the ruins in order to figure out the height of the blast as well. Now keep in mind that this, is, this was uh, you know, top secret information. The U.S. military, this was all classified information, and yet this one man wandering around with like a clinometer uh, and a rucksack like figured this stuff out. Um, and the other thing that he did, it was even more amazing, is during that time he started collecting artifacts from the ruins of Hiroshima. Uh, and by artifacts, what do I mean? I mean melted stone, fused glass, scorched roof tiles, right? Anything that was connected with that day, right? Watches stopped at 8.15. And with this collection, right, by the time he had finished determining where the bomb exactly had exploded, he had a collection of over a thousand artifacts, right? So um, he, uh, he decided to put them on display in uh, what's called a kominkan here in Japanese. So a kominkan is a... Um, it's a uh, community center, right? It's just a community center. And he laid out his, his, these artifacts, these A-bomb artifacts, he laid them out on tables and chairs swathed in paper, right? And that was the first humble beginnings of what would become the Peace Memorial Museum. So the A-bomb mayor, who I mentioned earlier, he recognized the significance of what, of what Shogo-san had on his hands. And so he, um, he had the city build a, a museum of sorts. Now keep in mind also that after the war, building materials were really scarce. You know, the um, metals were extremely expensive. Um, building materials were scarce and, and really difficult to get a hold of. And um, so he... Uh, the building that they were able to build was just like this one-story wooden structure that was built in, um, I believe, 1950, and um, you know, so just this like simple place to put the to put the the items. But at that same time, around that time, in 1948-1949, Hamai-san was also campaigning in Tokyo to get special funding to rebuild the city of Hiroshima. And um, when that law was passed, and it was passed unanimously, which is really amazing to think about because remember that Japan was still under occupation at that time. So for the, a law like this to pass, it also had to pass like the GHQ, the general headquarters of the occupation, also put their stamp of approval on this plan. And what this plan was, this bill, it was the um, Hiroshima Peace Memorial City Reconstruction Law. And um, what, uh, what, it did is it did three remarkable things. One is it gave a whole bunch of money to the city that was all earmarked for peace projects, right? So like they could work on like the peace park or the peace museum, but they couldn't build like a waterworks or something like that with it, right? The other things that it did, one is it granted all military land to the city. So um, from that point forward, there's been no military presence of any kind in Hiroshima. It's not only forbidden by the local law, it's forbidden by the national law. Right? We really are the city of peace. And uh, speaking of which, that was the third thing that that law did, is it officially recognized Hiroshima as the city of peace. And that was in 1949, and we've been known that way ever since. So after that, after that, um, they had money to build a real museum, quote-unquote, and that's what they did. They started working on it, and it opened in 1955, 10 years after the bombing. Um, it, that year that it opened, it had a staff of eight people, um, including the director, the museum director, Nago Shogo, the geologist who first started collecting those artifacts. Now, over time, um, many people donated their precious mementos from uh, you know from the bombing, people there you know either things that belong to them if they were in the bombing, like you saw Futagawa-san um, earlier today, perhaps give his testimony. He was in, he's an in utero hibaksha, and his uh, family gave a um, you know a blouse 
that had belonged to his sister who disappeared in the bombing. And, um, right, so some people who had survived gave their artifacts, and other families who just had lost people, you know, gave things. Like, this is the, you know, the, the half-burned clothing, you know, that my son had worn, right, on that day. Things like that. Um, so with that, the um, people started donating more and more things, and that first year it had over 100,000 visitors. And today, the museum's collection includes 20,000 A-bomb artifacts, 70,000 photographs, and 5,000 A-bomb drawings. In recent years, there's been over one and a half million people visiting the museum, um, but due to uh, coronavirus this year, I'm sure that number is going to be way, way smaller, uh, unfortunately. And they are doing things to, to put, like, uh, the, you know, some of the things online, like make, like, a virtual museum online. So you can check out um, the, if you just uh, type in, you know, Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum into Google, you'll be able to find their website and uh, look at some of the things that they're working on. So um, in that year, 1955, a lot of other really interesting things happened, like, kind of all at the same time. So um, as... The museum opened. They also finished the piece, uh, sorry, the, the, the A-bomb mound, the A-bomb mound. And the A-bomb mound was, um, that was the, uh, the, the place that they were able to finally put to rest the ashes of 70,000 unidentified A-bomb victims. And um, so that also was unveiled in 1955. Just three years prior, in 1952, uh, this is also worth mentioning, just to jump back a little bit, they unveiled the Cenotaph. The Cenotaph was unveiled by A-bomb orphans. And both these monuments, by the way, were presented earlier today. So if you want more details, please check out our, our earlier videos. Um, but the Cenotaph um, unveiled in 1952, and it was the first official memorial monument to the bombing. Um, I say official because um, it was unveiled on August 6th, 1952, but the war ended on Ap in April uh, 1952. And um, during the war, or sorry, during the occupation, during the occupation there was something called the Press Code. It was this law that was enforced by the occupation that prevented Japanese from building war memorials of any kind, including A-bomb memorials. And it also prevented people from talking about the bombing in the media, right? So there was this kind of, just, it's like a gag order, really, like nobody can talk about this. And there were some monuments that were built during that time, but they had to be classified as peace monuments. Um, they couldn't really have any memorial aspects to them, although some of the ones that were developed at that time, they kind of, had, they did have that, but in sort of a codified way. And it's actually a really interesting thing in, in its own right to study, and I hope that we have um, in the future uh, some more programs talking about some of those things. Um, but in any case, 1952, they unveiled the Cenotaph as the first official monument. Then in 1955, right, the museum opens, the A-bomb mound is unveiled, and also Sadako Sasaki, um, the girl who fold, who's known for folding a thousand paper cranes, she also died of leukemia that year, right? So all these things were happening at the same time. And um, then following that, there was a children's peace movement. The Children's Peace Monument was established um, in 1958. And um, then in 1966, the A-bomb dome, uh, which you are seeing right now, was um, preserved for all time. Um, so from there, the... Um, uh, that was really, and that was really like kind of in many ways sort of a renaissance in, in Hiroshima, right? Because there had been some monuments and things that were built, but once the, the A-bomb dome was preserved, it was preserved with donations from all across Japan. And as a result of that, people started thinking more and, you know, about what was happening in Hiroshima and talking more about it. And a lot of the monuments in the Peace Memorial Museum today um, are, they are actually, uh, they were built in 1967 because um, suddenly a lot of people were like, oh yeah, like, you know. We need to build monuments to other things, other groups of people that perished, right? Um, acknowledge more of what happened here. So um, that's kind of this slice of history, um, you know, here, here in Hiroshima and a lot of how things developed to where they are. Another really amazing thing that happened in 1955, um, um, actually, let me dial back a little bit further, in 1954, right? So all these things are happening, this kind of peace movement is happening, and people are, are more and more talking about what's going on with, with, with atomic bombs. 
But um, at the same time, atomic bombs are like being developed, right, more and more. And they have H-bombs and more powerful H-bombs that make, you know, what happened here in Hiroshima, a single bomb that wiped out, you know, the entire city pretty much, right? Make it look, they, they, they were developing new bombs that made that look like a firecracker, you know, like it's nothing compared to what they built after that. And they were testing them, you know. They were testing them, of course, in the States. And there are still people who suffer from radiation from those tests. They're called downwinders. And there are also, uh, and they were also testing them out in the Pacific Ocean at the Bikini Atoll. And one of those tests, it was the Castle Bravo test. Uh, it was an H-bomb test in 1954. It basted um, a fishing boat, a Japanese fishing boat, called the Fukuryu Maru No. 5. It basted it in radioactive fallout. And... Um, so suddenly there was like another group of A-bomb affected people, hibakusha as they're called in Japanese, um, who were just like these fishermen, right? Um, so the, the anti-nuclear movement um, really, uh, you know, was just like on fire um, after that. And in 1955, there was um, the first international conference for the abolition of A and H bombs. Um, so... Uh, that event was, was particularly remarkable because it was the first time that A-bomb survivors were sort of, you know, they were brought in to be part of, part of the, um, the nuclear abolition movement. And so the nuclear abolition movement and the A-bomb survivors have been linked, really officially linked, from that moment forward. So it was this really incredible time in 1955. And again, Sadako Sasaki dies of leukemia. The museum opens up. Um, you know, the... the, ma the uh, uh, a bomb mound is completed uh, with seventy thousand ashes in it. So um, you can see some of, of you know how these things developed. And meanwhile, they're building up the city and turning it into this amazing place that you see today. Um, and Hiroshima today has, I think, about one and a half million people living in it. Um, it's a beautiful place, and it's so sad that people can't come and visit us right now because of the coronavirus. But I hope um, that you, that all of you who are watching and listening, um, if you haven't been here, please do come. And if you have, please come join us, visit us again as soon as you can. You know, we're all going to get through this together. Coronavirus isn't going to last forever and nuclear weapons won't either, right? We're at a time when, um, so many things are changing in the world and people are taking action about issues of justice, right? About issues of war. And, um, and we can see from, the, from coronavirus that we're all in this together, right? This is one planet, and we can see how quickly things can change and that governments really can take pretty extreme action when they want to. And, uh, you know, it's time for us to, uh, to abolish nuclear weapons. Um, the ICANN Treaty only needs 10 more ratifications before it goes into international law, which will classify nuclear weapons along with biological weapons and chemical weapons as things that are absolutely unacceptable to use on human beings. Um, or any other living thing for that matter. Um, so with that progress, um, I hope that we're going to see some really amazing things happen. So um, these are the lanterns that are being put out um, to, uh, to, uh, into the river, and we're about to wrap up now because it's now past 7. Uh, thank you guys so much. I hope that there's still some folks listening to me uh, talk about the, the amazing history of the city. But um, if you haven't yet, please like, please subscribe. Um, we will be providing more content as we go forward. And um, thank you once again. If we could get up nice and close and give, uh, give a nice close shot of the, of the lanterns. And um, so we can see them. And then uh, we're all gathered here, too. And we're going to sign off and, and give you a nice wave goodbye. Um, but there you have it. Uh, lanterns floating, right? Keeping that tr tradition alive in spite, of, in spite of coronavirus. And so um, with that said... Uh, I'm going to, uh, we're going to turn and take a look and um, we will all uh, give you our, our, our thank yous and our farewells. So again, thank you very much for listening to me uh, tell you about this wonderful city that we call home. And please do come and visit us as soon as you can. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, we really appreciate you uh, watching our program. And um, please do join us once again uh, at our future programs and come visit Hiroshima as soon as you can. Thank you, uh, everyone, and we'll see you next time. All right, take care. Thank you.